Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rana Omer, and I would like to welcome you all to this live session, which has specially been organized to provide an update on municipal, provincial, and federal government response to COVID-19. There are lots of things are happening on all level of governments, which can only be explained in detail by the elected members. Today, we'll be joined by the municipal, provincial, and federal representatives of government from Mississauga Center, who will update and answer our questions related to COVID-19. You can also send us your questions through the messages and we'll try our level best to answer all your concerns. We are so blessed that we are living in a country where our federal government under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau trying their level best to facilitate us and provide us the maximum benefits to ease our life. To know more about federal government plan to deal with this pandemic, First of all, I would like to invite Honorable Umar, Umar al Gabra, who is Member of Parliament from Mississauga Center. Honor to have you in the show, Umar. How are you? Your mic is muted. You need to unmute your mic first. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. No problem. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Rana. Thank you so much uh, for moderating the session. And uh, let me start off as well by thanking uh, my friend and my colleague, uh, Natalia Kuzindova and her team for facilitating and orchestrating this uh, live uh, session. I'm um, looking forward to a meaningful and informative discussion. Uh, I also want to thank my colleague and my friend, Ron Starr, uh, um, city, council for, uh, city councilor for Ward 6. Uh, it's good to have him here, um, and uh, and it's a great opportunity. You know, uh, ever since uh, uh, COVID pandemic has started, we've been trying to sort things out and trying to communicate with our constituents in uh, ways that we didn't do um, before. So gone are the days where we get to meet them in person or attend events and shake hands and give hugs. So we're, uh, we're trying uh, different methods uh, via email, over the phone, and certainly uh, through technology like Zoom and Facebook Live and, and other technologies to continue to st be st uh, in touch uh, with our constituents. And I do want to take a moment to thank my team and my staff. Um, uh, we've been um, on guard uh, responding to emails and phone calls uh, from our constituents uh, ever since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that we are living under extraordinary times. Um, uh, none of us have seen anything like this uh, before. And, uh, we, um, and, and I'm heartened to see that uh, uh, Canada as a whole are standing united in, in confronting uh, this pandemic. And it's really great to see all levels of government work together, set aside any kind of partisanship differences, any kind of ideological differences, and be solely focused on what is it that we can do uh, to, to, uh, to slow down or even stop the spread of, uh, of the virus, but also to support all those people who were negatively impacted uh, by this pandemic. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for a few minutes about uh, the federal level response. Uh, our government uh, from day one has been guided by three major principles. First uh, is uh, ensuring that individuals who uh, have been impacted by uh, the pandemic, by the virus are supported financially and, 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 uh, and mentally uh, to make sure that we have the system in place to support people who lost their income or seen their income uh, uh, dissipate or been negatively impacted. So we've introduced the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, $2,000 a month for up to four uh, months to everybody who has seen their income reduced at least as uh, uh, $1,000 or less. Uh, they qualify, people who are an EI qualify for, for CERB. We've also introduced uh, a support for businesses so they are able to, uh, to uh, retain their employees We've introduced a 75% wage subsidy. Uh, so businesses uh, that have seen a significant slowdown or has been shut down even because of the virus can, can retain its employees. Uh, uh, the, the second uh, guiding principle is supporting our healthcare and our healthcare workers. So our, our government has uh, transferred um, half a billion dollars to the provinces in support 
uh, uh, just for the healthcare system in support of our healthcare system. In addition to that, we've dedicated $2 billion to ensure that we have adequate supplies of, of, of uh, medical equipment and, and uh, pr uh, protective uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. And we've allocated over a billion dollars for research in combating the virus and in identifying a vaccine. Uh, the third guiding principle is uh, making sure that our economy is supported at a time when we've basically have put it to, uh, into a self-induced coma uh, while we uh, defeat the virus. And, and, and the best way to do this is make sure that the businesses are, 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 uh, are as cohesive as possible so they are ready to take off again whenever we uh, restart our economy. And, and some of the mechanisms that we've supported, as I mentioned, one of them, which is the waste subsidy, but we've also introduced interest-free uh, loans that they don't have to be paid for a year and a half. And actually, if they're paid at the end of the year and a half, a uh, quarter of that loan, $10,000, will be forgiven. We've introduced uh, uh, other type of support uh, to hi for hiring students, uh, uh, for uh, uh, providing a rent subsidy, commercial rent subsidy. So uh, we are really guided by those three major principles, individual support, making sure that people are not left alone and not left behind and that they have the ability to feed themselves and their families, healthcare system and our economy. Uh, so I, I think I'll stop here, maybe I use my time, uh, but that, that's the broader outline of what our government has been focused on. Absolutely. You have pretty much explained uh, lots of things, but uh, there are lots of questions which people want to ask. And we have already started getting uh, lots of questions in the messages. So be prepared for that as well. Thank you so much, Omar, for providing us the detail update. And we'll definitely connect to you again uh, later in the show. So um, that was uh, Omar. And uh, now we are uh, connecting to uh, again one of our uh, member of provincial parliament. As we all know that the government of Ontario, under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, has taken wonderful steps so far to deal with the COVID-19. To get more updates on that, now we are connecting to Natalia Kosindova, who is also a member, member of provincial parliament. But uh, with that, she is also our frontline health worker and our hero as well. Welcome to the show, Natalia. How are you? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having us, Rana. And I just wanted to say uh, Ramadan Mubarak to yourself as well to thank my colleague. Much. On the fifth Thank floor, you, uh, uh, Omar Al Gabra, we are in the same building, uh, and I know that it is a, a time for reflection and fasting for my Muslim friends. And so, I'm wishing you uh, determination uh, and all the best during this uh, holy month of Ramadan. Uh, and it, it's my pleasure. So it's it's wonderful to be here today. I also wanted to say a big hello to uh, my colleague Ron Starr, uh, Councillor for Ward Six. And uh, as Omar has mentioned, uh, you know, right now it's really Team Canada, Team Ontario. Uh, our Premier has said it himself many times. There are no colors right now, no blue team, no red team, it's just one team. And so that's truly really been the silver lining um, in this uh, situation uh, that, uh, that uh, we are all working hand in hand. Uh, and I know uh, uh, the Prime Minister is doing his daily briefings uh, as well as our Premier. And the Premier has been uh, in daily communication with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Krisha Freeland. And so it's really uh, good to see that uh, cooperation among all levels of government. Um, and so today I just wanted to give you a brief update uh, what we've been doing here at the Government of uh, Ontario. Uh, you know, it's um, it's been about uh, over a month now, and so with the daily updates and the daily announcements, uh, there's quite a bit of information circulating. So I just want to remind everyone, uh, you know, to be very careful where you consume your information. There's a lot of fake news out there, and so the best advice that we can always get is from our uh, chief medical officers. Uh, they have the most up-to-date and most credible information based on research. And so, uh, you know, that's where I have been getting my updates and uh, I want to share some of that information with you today. And um, so, as you know, our, our Minister of Finance, Rod Phillips, uh, has announced in his uh, sp uh, spring economic uh, update um, a $17 billion package to support people, businesses, and our healthcare workers in these unprecedented, unprecedented times. Uh, in our response uh, in the fight against COVID. Out of the $17 billion, $7 billion uh, is an urgent direct support for people, businesses, and our healthcare system. And uh, the $10 billion is in cash flow uh, to support people and businesses in this difficult time. Together, it's a $17 billion 
response. Um, out of that, $3.3 billion went for uh, immediate cash flow and immediate support of our frontline workers. And as uh, Rana, you've mentioned, I have uh, returned back to the emergency room um, at my local hospital. And, you know, I can attest to that our frontline workers are some of the best that we have in the world. And they're, they're doing their part each and every day to keep us safe. And we have protocols in place to ensure the safety of patients and the safety of staff, such as, you know, we have a strict no visitor policy. Uh, we also make sure that uh, we screen uh, we screen everyone that's coming in and we separate our COVID presumptive cases from uh, from everybody else. And so I just want to, you know, urge everyone and just, um, you know, reassure everyone that our hospitals are safe. Uh, we have seen a decrease in volumes, which is kind of interested anecdotally to note, uh, especially, for example, uh, when it comes to cardiac cases. I worked a few shifts in the cardiac assessment zone. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of people coming through. So I just want to remind everyone that if you are having heart attack like symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, malaise, et cetera, please, our hospitals are safe. A heart attack will kill you a lot faster than COVID. So please do not uh, do not be scared to come into your hospital because, uh, you know, um, a delay uh, in care uh, may be fatal. So I just want to reassure you that hospitals are safe and please do come in for any medical emergencies. Um, so we have, so part of that $3.3 billion package uh, in support of our uh, acute care facilities, our frontline hospitals, um, part of this investment has created an additional 1,000 uh, acute care beds, out of which are 500 critical uh, care beds, in addition to over 70 COVID-19 assessment centers. So as you may be aware, our uh, COVID assessment center in the region of Peel is located at uh, Peel Memorial Hospital in Brampton. And so that is the center where, um, where we expect people who are having mild to moderate COVID symptoms to go present themselves uh, to, do, uh, to get their swab done uh, to be checked for COVID. The first step, of course, is to uh, call Telehealth Ontario and to speak to a registered nurse. And then would be to proceed to go to one of these 70 uh, COVID-19 assessment centers. But once again, if you are having severe symptoms, uh, of COVID or any other uh, emergencies, please do directly go to your emergency room. And uh, so uh, Omar has mentioned, uh, um, you know, personal protective equipment, which is vital. It's absolutely vital that we protect frontline workers, nurses, doctors, PSWs, uh, you know, janitors, uh, our dietitians, everyone who is involved in the, uh, in the care of our COVID patients, but all of our patients uh, need to be protected. So that is why we have invested $75 million uh, in the first uh, sort of package to uh, procure more personal protective equipment. And we've been working hand in hand with the federal government to ensure that Ontario does get an adequate supply. And that supply has been flowing to our front lines. Of course, sometimes there are some temporary shortages. Um, and so in, the, in those cases, my office has been trying to fill them um, because we have had some generous donors from the community, different community cultural organizations, businesses, dentists, um, nail salons have stepped up to donate personal protective equipment, which has been redistributed to the front lines. And so we have launched an initiative called Ontario Together, which allowed us to partner with the private sector to increase production of vital medical equipment right here at home. And so we have some success stories that uh, that have come out of that. Maybe I will mention just one. So, uh, so Spartan Technologies uh, is an Ontario-based um, uh, company in, in Ottawa, which is providing a point-of-care uh, type of screening tool uh, for COVID-19. And so instead of waiting two to three days to receive a result from uh, from the swab, it can actually be done at the point of care in a one hour uh, time slot. And so we have procured at the government of Ontario, 900,000 of these tests, and we are hoping that they will uh, be coming in very soon. Uh, and that will truly re revolutionize the way we test our patients in Ontario. And so I know that, um, you know, something that has been very top of mind for, for many people, um, uh, you know, myself included, is our long-term care homes. We have our family members, our grandparents, our parents who are uh, in long-term care. And truly and honestly, I believe right now uh, that this is where the fight is being fought in our long-term care homes. And that is why our government has invested an additional $243 million uh, in search capacity to ensure that we have around-the-clock screening 
Uh, we have also provided some direction as to more staff flexibility, uh, sanitation and personal uh, protective equipment, which is truly key in ensuring the protection of our, uh, of our most vulnerable populations, because we know that seniors are hit um, the hardest when it comes to their health outcomes. And that is why it's so key to support them. We have also announced initiatives uh, to help support seniors who are living at home uh, to provide uh, grocery delivery services. Uh, so in the tune of, I believe, $10 million, um, organizations can apply, uh, organizations that are directly working with seniors or Meals on Wheels, uh, to access this additional funding uh, in order to make sure that we put that iron ring of protection around our seniors, as our Premier has mentioned. And my office, we have also launched the service. So for anyone in Mississauga Center or really across Mississauga, if uh, you are a senior in isolation and you're struggling, uh, we're more than happy to connect you with uh, with a, a service uh, for groceries or for, uh, for running other uh, essential errands. Because we really want to make sure that everyone who's 60 and above does stay at home as much as possible. Uh, we have also invested in uh, virtual care and telehealth Ontario in the tune of about $160 million. And I think it's really important uh, that we start really thinking about different ways we can deliver healthcare in Ontario. I know that this is something we thought about even prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic has really forced our hand to, uh, you know, to speed up this process a little bit because uh, uh, we, we should be taking advantage of technology and for certain health conditions, uh, it's more than appropriate that, uh, you know, patients are connected with their service providers through telehealth. And so we are making those investments um, to, you know, to really um, ensure um, better access to care, especially for patients who are living in more remote and rural uh, communities, which includes some of our indigenous uh, populations. Um, so I have a lot more notes to go through here, but maybe I'll just wrap it up for now um, and to say that uh, today um, our premier, um, together with some of our ministers, have made an announcement on how we will be slowly um, uh, reopening the economy. Uh, the Premier was very careful about how he said it. He said it's not a calendar, it's rather a roadmap uh, because we have to be very conscientious of how we do this. So it's a three-phased approach um, and I can speak about that a little bit more. And I guess I, I forgot to mention uh, one thing about our students. Uh, I know that for a lot of students, uh, you know, OSAP repayments and um, loans is something that, uh, you know, they've been worried about. So we have suspended uh, um, any repayments until September 30th, and students will not be accumulating any interest uh, right now uh, for the next uh, six months. Um, so it's a penalty-free grace period. Um, so anyway, I look forward to your questions. Uh, um, you know, healthcare is something that I'm obviously very, very passionate about. Uh, I plan to now transition into the long-term care sector because I, I think that my skills uh, can be utilized there. I know that we have several homes that are on outbreak uh, in Mississauga. And in fact, I spoke with Dr. Lowe, who is our chief medical officer today, uh, about how our government can better support the long-term care sector. And, uh, you know, again, it's just so reassuring to see that we are all working together with our chief medical officers and our different levels of government. So I really look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate your work. And we have already got so many um, messages, and everybody's saying you rock, Natalia. You're doing an amazing <laughs> job, and definitely you are doing an amazing job. Thank you so much, and we'll connect to you again. We uh, uh, will definitely ask a few questions. So later, we will definitely connect back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Uh, so that was uh, Natalia Kosindova, and uh, as you guys can uh, send us the messages uh, and uh, ask your questions, ask your concerns and uh, with that we already got a few questions on the email as well so we'll be asking those questions as well but right now i am uh, connecting to our respected counselor from ward six uh, mr ron star welcome to the show sir how are you i'm doing great uh, rena and, and thank you for uh, letting me be part of this uh, great discussion um you know, it's sad to say, but the, I think the comments have been made already. We've never been through something like this, to, uh, you know, at, at all levels of government. And it's really amazing and it's gratifying to see that we're all working together, uh, tr trying to get the, through this uh, pandemic. At the city level, um, as most uh, folks know, uh, we're the grass at the uh, we're the grassroots people. We're the roads. We're the parks. We're the uh, health system uh, at the region. 
uh, we take care of the garbage and and all the other items uh, that sometimes uh, I, I I think we we feel that uh, those folks are neglected and I just want to uh, do a big shout out to a number of those people that uh, I think are are our real heroes and and I'm I'm not only talking about the healthcare workers and the uh, doctors but the uh, paramedics and the uh, truck drivers uh, the uh, nurses uh, who are working uh, in some cases double shifts. The police. Um, when when I think about the grocery clerks uh, working day in and day out trying to keep the uh, shelves stocked uh, because of the hoarding, which again is another subject. And one I've just uh, uh, had a discussion with today is the waste management. All the garbage and all and all these uh, uh, items, uh, your your recyclables are, are still being picked up by people that are doing their job. And I want to say that uh, it, it's it, it's really something that, that we can all work together. We're all working for the one cause because we're all in it together, and and that's the problem. Uh, if we if we let up, uh, we're going to see different curves. And I think history has proven that with SARS and, and even the, the in the diseases in the past. But at the city level, uh, we've been meeting regularly. I think we were the first council to start meeting every week. I'm not even sure if other councils are, are doing that. We're doing that so that the residents uh, know that their council and the mayor, by the way, who is meeting almost every day online, with uh, her counterparts, uh, we're, we're trying to get through this pandemic in the best fashion possible. We're exchanging information. We're trying to be uh, first uh, out of the shoot with uh, new ideas and how do we do it better. And when I think of the cost of all of this, uh, and I'm sure that's going to be brought up, but the, so far, we think just in, in the next couple, three months, uh, it's going to cost the city of Mississauga over fifty million, perhaps closing in at sixty million dollars. That's a lot of money. That's uh, close to eight hundred thousand million dollars a day. But again, uh, for the public, we've taken uh, drastic steps. Uh, something that maybe we didn't want to do. The city of Mississauga, for instance, take, took a look at their staffing, and uh, with great reluctance, uh, we furloughed or laid off some two thousand part-time people. Not easy to do, but fortunately, there's a, a, a network of, of dollars that are available from the province and the and the uh, feds, and I'm, I really appreciate that, Omar and, and Natalia, that there are programs that are being in place to protect people. We need the safety net, and because the city itself can't do it. We can provide a lot of the daily day-to-day uh, -day services and and uh, tell folks that the parks are open, but they're not open. Uh, you know, to self-isolate, walk five feet apart, uh, don't go to work if you don't have to. And and I think it's the same message that's coming across from uh, all levels of government uh, to, to to stay isolated and to do your part. Because this is a pandemic that uh, knows, uh, I think, no limit. And and uh, I, I think it was brought out just the other day that if we let up and we only let a few people get through get through the net of being protected, that can start all the, 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 the whole issue, the whole pandemic all over again. So I think it's a matter of being safe. It's a matter of being work, uh, of trying to work together. Uh, with all levels of government and working together with with your with your own friends and people, and and that's another thing. Sometimes we don't talk about when we talk about dollars and cents. Stay in touch with your friends. Stay in touch with your relatives and see how they're doing. And especially the seniors. Uh, I have to tell you, um, uh, I, I'm in a situation where my mother, who just turned 101 uh, at a birthday party uh, six weeks ago, that we couldn't attend because we we're all locked down. Uh, that's that's what's happening, and and then people like that they're isolated, really isolated. They don't know why they're being isolated and kept in their rooms. And I think if anyone out there has anyone that's been ill or uh, needs a little encouragement, give them a call because I think it, it's so important that we all work together and and uh, we'll try to uh, make sure that we don't have further emergencies. And. Um, the, the other thing I just want to mention, and, and I'm sure there's going to be either questions or comments on this, is that we're doing our best for our youth also. Think of all the sports groups and all the outdoor activities and 
everything that we think about for our 200,000 or more, 250,000 young people that are into sports of some sort or outdoor activities, they're at home. They may be walking, they may be bicycling, whatever, but the hockey's done, the baseball, the lacrosse, the cricket, uh, and all the other uh, sports that, uh, w uh, you know, that w even the unorganized sports teams, um, they're all shut down. We're not sure when that's going to uh, uh, happen uh, insofar as openings. Uh, we see what the province is um, initiating with further school closed downs. So that's probably going to mean the school properties are closed. So let's work together. It's a matter of uh, uh, staying together and uh, doing the best we can and listening. And I'm very, I'm very interested to hear what some of the folks out in the audience uh, have to say. And we'll try the answer as best we can. So, Rana, thanks very much, and especially Natalia, uh, for putting this together. The sound. So I'm so sorry, the mic was muted. So I was basically thanking you for providing us the valuable update. And uh, definitely, we all have to work together in this pandemic. We all have to uh, work together to make sure that the things are going in the right path. And uh, you provided some definitely very valuable updates. And we are getting lots of questions as well. So we'll connect to you again and ask those questions to you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, uh for connecting so um as you know, we are getting lots and lots of messages and lots and lots of emails and questions questions and questions because people want to know certain things people want to know what's going on on the federal level what's going on the on the provincial level what's going on in the uh, municipal level so everybody have lots of things we'll try to answer all those questions uh, but let's see how good we can do that so i've got the first question and the first question is for omar and uh, omar i've got a question uh, from Gabriel, who's uh, sending message from Mrs. Saga, and he's asking, what happens? Well, this is a very, very common question, which is definitely going on in my mind all the time as well. What happens if um, I have applied for both EI and CERB, which is a Canada Emergency Response Benefit? So if somebody has applied for both of these things, so what's going to happen, Omar, in this particular situation? So uh, uh, thank you, uh, Rana, for the question. If uh, uh, the EI system is basically completely transferred to uh, under SERP, so if anybody had applied for EI, uh, they will automatically be transferred onto SERP. Um, if somebody applied for both, it's going to be reconciled and uh, the person will receive uh, SERP. So until uh, as we are going through the pandemic, um, um, EI system has been converted to SERP. Everybody who's uh, 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 eligible will be receiving the $2,000 a month. Oh, that's that's really very good. Any like everybody who will be eligible will be receiving two thousand dollar per month. But the system, I guess, has already been designed that way. That if you apply for the both things, then it can uh, already be balanced. Thank you so much. Uh, there are more questions coming for you, but uh, now I'm moving to Natalia because uh, there is a question for her. So Natalia, since definitely people are more concerned about the health, health, and health, and you are the right person to ask uh, the questions regarding the health. And uh, I've got a question from uh, Laureen. And she is um, uh, sending a message from Pickering, and she's asking, um, "How is the government managing the distribution of PPE? Means personal protection equipment. How is the government? I, I see the boxes in your background as well. I think yes. that's also <laughs> PPE." <laughs> Yes, well, thank you so much, Laureen, for that very, very important question. And so I know that PPE has been top of mind for uh, the healthcare providers themselves, but also their family members who are worried, you know, uh, about the health of their loved ones, but also they want to make sure that they're not bringing, uh, you know, anything home. And so, uh, you know, uh, before this pandemic, uh, the each hospital had their own, uh, sort. it was very decentralized the way hospitals procured their personal protective equipment. They had these uh, purchasing groups, which would be doing their bidding and uh, sort of they had different uh, hospital organizations working together. But because of the pandemic, uh, we really needed to bring that all in uh, at the government level to make sure that we have adequate supply across the board. And so what we've done is uh, we are now requiring all hospitals and all uh, medical institutions to provide daily uh, 
uh, daily updates to the government as to their consumption of PPE so that we know uh, how much is being uh, consumed where and where are the shortages and where are the needs. And so we have created five regional uh, PPE tables which report directly to uh, to our command table, uh, which is being led by the chief medical officer and, and many of our ministers. And so that we have a daily, uh, you know, uh, daily information coming in as to uh, where the needs are the greatest and and where uh, we may we may need to supplement those needs and so uh, so through those five regional tables uh, organizations can feed uh, that information to us but we also have our parliamentary uh, assistant to the minister of uh, of um, the minister of health uh, Robin Martin who is sort of our PPE person in, within our government and so if there are any shortages uh, uh, you know, she is the one who uh, organizations can reach out to to ensure that we are putting in, uh, you know, new orders and that they are um, getting the appropriate um, appropriate equipment. But to date, uh, we have purchased over 90 million uh, in critical supplies and equipment, which includes over 50,000 units of sanitizer, more than 20 million masks and 250,000 face shields. And, you know, I have to say one little success story right here from Mississauga. Uh, one of my team members, actually, uh, he's, you know, uh, one of my volunteers that does some photography for me. Uh, he has a print shop, Andy Staniszewski, and he has actually converted his uh, print shop into producing some face shields for our frontline workers, which we have been donating to, uh, you know, to the facilities that needed the most. And so once again, uh, you know, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to all the businesses that have stepped up uh, because uh, we have had over 16,000 submissions to our website, which is called Ontario Together. And we are providing about $50 million in funding to some of these businesses to retool their manufacturing. And so we can have actual uh, per uh, protect personal protective equipment produced right here in Ontario. And I know that it was about two weeks ago that the Premier has personally picked up uh, some of these made in Ontario masks. And so, uh, again, uh, thank you to our businesses for stepping up. Uh, and it's great to see our, our manufacturers uh, right here locally supporting our frontline workers. Absolutely. There's a support and everybody is supporting. Thank you so much, Natalia, for the detailed answer. And we'll get back to you again soon. So, um, as she mentioned earlier, that uh, right now in this pandemic, everybody is working together and it's basically not the duty of any particular person or group it's everyone's duty it's everyone's responsibility to act in a way that we should wash our hands we should stay at home and we should definitely um, understand the sensitivity of this pandemic uh, and we are getting uh, questions questions and questions uh, from uh, different people now i've uh, got a question for um counselor uh, ron star and uh, um Okay, Akbar is asking from Mississauga, and you were also talking about some sports activities as well. So what is City doing to help sports groups, minor sports, youth groups, both from a scheduling and financially? What is uh, City up to? Actually, that's a, that's a great question because just today we uh, had a uh, WebEx meeting uh, online, same as we're doing with Facebook today. We had 116 groups that... Uh, spoke we invited i think uh, close to 200 to come and tell us uh, what they'd like to see happening and the city is fully engaged with the community sports uh, providers and we want their comments uh, because we want them coming back and uh, at the same time we need to know uh, what their plans are insofar as uh, future uh, endeavors the the city facilities for any of the tenants um, it's been deferred and if that means of any of the groups that uh, we're going to be using uh, uh, facilities, whatever, that's been deferred and or is going to be canceled. We have an emer a $1 million emergency fund to uh, help the uh, incorporated nonprofits um, that uh, by the region. And that was helped also by the Fed, federal government and provincial government. And that goes to those groups that uh, really are going to be in trouble if they don't have their fundraisers, if they don't have their fees in place, etc. And And I, I want to tell you that uh, there's uh, in the next day or two, there's going to be a complete lineup of uh, where the sports groups, especially the sports groups uh, for all age groups, whether they're uh, children, youth or seniors. And that's another area that, uh, you know, we forget about so that there's a lot of seniors playing games now and, and uh, even the seniors games are canceled. But we're working together with them and we're working with the other levels of government. So go online. 
and and I think if you can visit the city at the Futures Unlimited, but uh, actually anyone going to any of the sites, you it's pretty easy, easy to navigate. We've made it that way, and you can see what we're doing for all the sports groups, and uh, we're uh, we're really hoping and we're excited to see that uh, that hopefully we can even uh, get them into the fall time. Absolutely. And uh, hope is definitely very important in this pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron, for answering this uh, question. And uh, um, as we said, we are definitely getting lots of questions on the messages as well. And we will definitely try our level best to answer all those questions. Next question is for uh, Omar. And this uh, question has been sent by, let me see. OK, uh, so this question was um, sent by Kathy from uh, Scarborough, and uh, Kathy is asking. Let, first of all, let me just uh, bring Omar back on screen. So, Omar, Kathy is asking that I'm pregnant and did not plan on using my mat leave during this time. I do not want COVID nineteen to affect my mat leave. What should I do? That's the question. Well, uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Rana. Um, Look, if uh, if the person, uh, if Kathy is eligible for SERP, uh, meaning she has either lost her income or her income has been reduced to $1,000 or less a month, um, and she would qualify uh, for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit for SERP. Um, she doesn't need to go on maternity leave early. She can just apply for SERP and get the support that she needs um, at this time. Uh, while we preserve her maternity leave until um, uh, she uh, hopefully gives her birth uh, and brings us a, a healthy uh, baby. Oh, that's 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 really very really good. Uh, thank you so much uh, for answering the question, Omar. And uh, now I have to go back to uh, Natalia. And uh, Natalia, I've uh, got a question for you. And this question is uh, from Renee. And Renee is sending message from Toronto. And Renee is asking, what is the government doing to protect people in the long-term care facilities? This is the question I guess you'll be getting like back to back again and again. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the government plan? Because there are lots of uh, unfortunate deaths in the long-term um, facilities. So what is your answer for that? Yes, of course. So we've seen that the long-term care facilities are the ones being hit the hardest, uh, not only in Ontario, but also in Quebec and across our provinces, because as we know, um, our seniors have the worst health outcomes, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to survival rates and, and how the, the virus impacts them. And so uh, part of our response was an initial $15 million investment allocated into our long-term care sector to support 24-7 screening, additional staffing, and uh, also better infection control uh, procedures. Uh, but recently, uh, our minister, Merle Fullerton, has announced the COVID-19 action plan for protecting long-term care homes. And uh, this plan includes a five-pronged approach, um, but again, it goes back to very aggressive testing and screening and surveillance of the virus, um, outbreak management and spread of disease, which includes, you know, uh, training staff, um, our, you know, PSWs and our frontline staff on how to properly don and doff uh, our personal protective equipment. So not only supplying the personal protective equipment, but also educating our, our health force on how to properly use it uh, or give them a refresher. Uh, we're also growing our health force. We know that, uh, you know, uh, staffing uh, can be an issue. And so we have, uh, you know, provided some flexibility measures, but uh, we're also trying to contain the virus. So part of our response is to ensure that, uh, you know, we don't have workers going in between homes or working at several different homes, but only sticking to one long-term care facility. And so we have, uh, you know, um, additional supports uh, for those employers uh, to provide perhaps a, a full-time hours for some of the staff so that the staff picks only one home to go into. But I also wanted to clarify um, I guess one um, uh, one m misconception that has been going around is that uh, frontline staff, such as myself, uh, I'm a registered nurse, I work at a local hospital, uh, that I would have to quit my job at the, uh, at the hospital in order to work in long-term care. So uh, that is incorrect. I have checked with our Ministry of Long-Term Care. I can, in fact, uh, keep my job at the hospital, but also work at, uh, at a long-term care facility. But again, it can only be one long-term care facility I cannot be going between long-term care facilities because, uh, again, we're trying to contain the spread of the virus. Um, and so I, I think these uh, more aggressive measures that have been introduced uh, recently by um, Minister Fullerton 
uh, will help us flatten the curve because, you know, our premier has said the second battle is right now being fought in long term care. And I know that uh, we are monitoring the situation very closely and we have some, uh, you know, hot, uh, that's what the minister calls it, red hot homes across Ontario that we're monitoring very closely. And we may be asking or we have asked for some additional supports from the federal government. And uh, those details are being discussed at that level right now. Thank you so much, Natalia, for the detailed answer. And uh, uh, we, are, we are getting, as I'm mentioning again and again, we are getting lots and lots of uh, questions. Uh, and uh, right now, those people who have just joined, so let me just tell you that uh, today we have uh, all three levels of government from Mississauga Center. We have the councillor, um, uh, Ron Starr, with us. Uh, we have the member of uh, provincial parliament, uh, uh, Natalia. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, my bad. I was basically on the screen. So we have uh, Natalia Kosindova with us, and then we have a uh, member of parliament, uh, Omar Al Gabra, with us. Uh, so all the uh, three level of comment is with us uh, from Mississauga Center to answer your questions, uh, to answer your queries. And this is definitely the time when we all have to sit together. We all have to work on this pandemic, to get rid of this pandemic, to get out of this pandemic uh, as soon as we can. So now I've got a question for Mr. Ron Starr. And uh, this uh, question has been sent by Carl from Mississauga. And Carl is asking, is the city helping small businesses? Uh, what information and programs are available for the small businesses? What do you want to say, sir? Rana, that's a, gr a great question because I think the small businesses especially have been hit hard. And um, and we've taken steps that uh, any license renewal fees, late renewal uh, license fees, uh, those uh, those fees have been waived. Uh, the municipal accommodation tax, which uh, is a tax on residents or anybody using hotels, uh, that's been deferred until a future date. Uh, we've had a deferral of a commercial. Uh, uh, commercial property taxes. As a matter of fact, I think there's even a program being looked at uh, both federally and provincially that maybe there's a way to supplement that. The signed bylaw uh, uh, folks uh, have implemented the ability uh, that are not normally legal, but uh, signage to allow for businesses to advertise uh, if they are open or, or if they are open restaurants, especially for online and takeaways, that sort of thing. We also have our uh, economic development people uh, providing free online business support webinars. Those are held on a regular basis, and that really brings up to date all the programs that are going on at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels so that small businesses know that they can turn to uh, one-stop shopping and say, okay, where, where can I go uh, to get help uh, immediately? And it's already worked out in several cases where uh, the small businesses, because they are eligible for help from the other levels of government, they've gone to these uh, webinars or listened to them and then uh, have been able to fill out the proper applications. And then also to know what their employees can do because the smaller businesses have been particularly hit hard, then we have to take care of those employees uh, and, and in the best fashion possible. So we are working very, very diligently and and um, even for workers that are working we provided free transit and suspension of any uh, residential parking fees or fines sound okay uh, okay sorry sound again sound again this is what happens in the live broadcast so uh regarding the small businesses and now i've got a question for uh, Omar, thank you so much for answering this uh, question in detail, and uh, we'll definitely connect back to you again. And uh, Omar, uh, regarding this uh, small businesses, uh, I've got a question from. Uh, uh, okay, so where was the question? Okay, here was the question. I've got a question from Sandy. Sandy's uh, sending a question from Toronto. What support is there for businesses that have a contract workers and therefore do not meet the payroll criteria for? SIBA and SUIs like Canada Emergency Benef Business Account and Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. What do you want to say about that? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Rana. And look, um, the uh, purpose uh, for these initiatives are first to support the individuals who have seen their income being impacted and also to support businesses so they can uh, stay ready uh, when uh, our economy is back um, 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 opened up. 
So uh, uh, yes, there are some criteria that not every business uh, meets, but uh, let me first say that it's as broad as possible. So every business that has a payroll of $20,000 a year or more is eligible to re receive the wage subsidy, $20,000 a year. So I, I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of businesses have a payroll of $20,000 a year or more, and they all would be eligible uh, and if they've seen some impact on their revenue, they would be eligible for receiving the waste subsidy. Now, I, I accept that the fact that there are some businesses, a small number of businesses that do not qualify for that, either because it's a sole proprietor or, or like this question, uh, they have staff on contract, not direct employees. Um, so what, uh, what, you know, the contractors uh, are not eligible for waste subsidy because they're not direct employees. So uh, the business, and by the way, the business could still hopefully be eligible to receive the $40,000 interest-free loan. And I would encourage uh, 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 business operators to, uh, to uh, pursue that option. They would also be hopefully eligible, depending on the type of business they have and the type of lease they have, for uh, uh, some subsidy uh, from their landlord for their commercial uh, space. But what I would encourage them, if they don't, uh, have, if their contractor uh, uh, don't qualify because they're not employees, they can consider hiring them. They can consider hiring their contractors, and suddenly they become employees and might be eligible for that 75% uh, wage subsidy. All right, uh, perfect. Uh, thank you so much uh, for answering the question, uh, Omar, and we'll connect back to you again. So, uh, questions, question, and question. Next question is for. Um, Natalia, once again, and uh, this is not related to the healthcare. Finally, you were now yeah. people are asking. They want to know about lots of other stuff today. We have got some announcements from the government as well. And this question is, I guess, related to that. Uh, so um, um, we have got a question from uh, Ozzy from Juan, and he's asking that my company needs to open soon. How is the province going to open up the economy? Mm. Well, so that's a really good question, um, and that's something that our government has been working on diligently for a few weeks now because I know that there are business owners out there who are very nervous and who want to get back to work. And so today we have announced um, a three-phase approach, uh, how we foresee opening up the economy. But again, I want to caution that this is a roadmap. It is not a calendar. So right now we cannot give specific timelines. But within each one of the phases, uh, you know, we will continue to rely rely on the advice of our chief medical officer and uh, they will carefully monitor each stage for two to four weeks and as they assess the evolution of the COVID-19 outbreaks we we will make necessary uh, changes to the course of action to maintain public health because our number one priority is to maintain the health and safety of all Ontarians and so for stage one um, uh, for stage one, it will uh, apply to businesses who can actually make some modifications to safely follow uh, the advice of our public health officials. So if they can, uh, you know, uh, ensure that there is uh, proper social distancing protocols and they can put those safety measures in place, uh, also ensure proper sanitation, um, that there is hand washing stations or that they have adequate supply of sanitizer for their workers, as long as they're following uh, all of the, um, you know, requirements from our public health officials, they may be able to open um, to a limited scale uh, of their of their operations. Uh, also, phase one would include opening some outdoor parks uh, and allowing for a greater number of individuals uh, to gather. And also very importantly, for uh, some hospitals, they will start to begin to offer some of those non-urgent uh, and scheduled sur surgeries. So I, I know that even for my family, uh, this is very important that those uh, elective surgeries uh, are starting to proceed once again. As we, you know, in good news, we are not seeing a, a, a huge surge in our acute care facilities. So we want to make sure that uh, those people who have been waiting now for uh, up to six weeks for their uh, non-elective surgeries can uh, start getting them and start getting uh, scheduled for them. In phase two, uh, we will be opening up uh, more work uh, places, uh, again, based on risk assessment, which may include some service, service industries and additional office and retail workplaces. And we will allow some larger public gatherings uh, and more outdoor spaces would be allowed to open. And in the last and final stage, uh, stage three, we would responsibly open up all workplaces 
uh, and we would further relax some of the restrictions on public gatherings. But again, I just want to say a word of caution. This is a roadmap, not a calendar. And so, you know, bear with us each day. We will give you an update which, which stage we are on. And we will seek uh, help um, and, and advice from our um, public health uh, officers and that we will proceed in ca with caution. Thank you so much. Well, this is a good thing. And especially you, you said that in the first phase, you guys will be opening the parks. This will be a good news for my kids. They are tired of jumping on the backyard trampoline. So thank you so much, uh, Natalia. And um, I've got a question for Ron now. And uh, the question is uh, from uh, Mandeep from Mississauga. And Mandeep is asking Ron that can you explain um, the city programs, taxes, fees that have been deferred or reduced? Can you give some uh, brief detail on that? I, I can, and that's close to the heart for everyone. Everyone that's a resident uh, basically in Mississauga. And uh, as you may have read, uh, the April, May, and June interim property taxes uh, have been deferred uh, for 90 days. And there's no interest on that. Yes, they will have to be paid, but uh, in the meantime, it makes it a little bit easier uh, that these taxes are being deferred. Stormwater charge, it's not a large one, but that's been deferred for three months. And as many of you know, and especially those that have to use the transit system to get to their jobs, uh, it's free transit for as long as uh, the pandemic pandemic is going on uh, and to make it safe we've used only rear door uh, rear door boarding uh, that keeps the driver safe and then we've limited the number of people in buses so we've kept all the buses operating as as, uh, as they were before even though there's been a reduced ridership and there's been a suspension of parking enforcement and that is uh, if you're parking too long on the street or um, in your driveway and there's, uh, say, minor offenses, those are being uh, 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 not enforced the way they uh, used to be. That doesn't mean now if you park in front of a hydrant or if you're in a fire zone, etc., that's not going to be tagged. Uh, yes, that's, that's still uh, quite illegal. And then we've been, the, the, one of the biggest things we've been doing is working with the food banks all across Mississauga. You may have read that uh, I think the number is close to $800,000 in cash, and that's in cash that was raised because of the lack of food that was being provided by volunteers and donors. And so the food banks have had, actually had to go out and buy food. And uh, that, you know, we have a lot of angels out there that were able to come forward and and uh, just contribute uh, out of, from their heart. So there's many, many programs like that. And, and, uh, and again, part of them overlap with businesses uh, uh, that we're, we're all working together. And as I said before, we're all in this together and the residents especially, I think, appreciate that. Absolutely. We definitely appreciate that. And as you mentioned that the fines have been reduced and, you know, the overall city and the cops are being reluctant, but it doesn't mean right. that you overspeed. It doesn't mean that you park in front of the hydrants or do some other crazy stuff because you will still going to get ticket for that. Thank you so much, Ron. And yeah. we'll connect back to you again. Uh, now I've got a question from uh, Prasad uh, who has sent us a message and this uh, Question is uh, for Omar, and Omar Prasad is asking that any support available to recent startups, they may not have any revenue in the previous year. So, what uh, what is the thing for them? Um, uh, I want to thank Prasad for this good question. Let me first say that what we've done uh, throughout this process is that we first started uh, by uh, providing support to people who most need it, and we launched an initiative right away based on that. And then what? as we learn uh, and discover few areas of gaps, we work on uh, releasing uh, other initiatives that help bridge that gap. So one of the things we actually announced last week under uh, uh, the leadership of the Prime Minister and Minister, uh, our colleague here in Mississauga, Minister Navdeep Baines, uh, last week we announced the $250 million to fund, to help support startups. Uh, small startups, or obviously all startups are small, uh, businesses uh, who are developing and commercializing innovative, uh, technology-driven, uh, that improves product, that improve processes in Canada, that don't have revenue, can qualify to apply for this. Uh, uh, it's called the Innovation Assistance Program. And for anybody who's looking for more information, they can visit nrc.canada.ca. 
The information is on that website. And it, uh, this initiative is uh, tailored uh, for startups. That's perfect. And that's nrc.canada.ca, you said? Correct. All right. So this is the website where you can go all the entrepreneurs or the startups. If you are concerned, you're not making any money, you didn't make any money, you can definitely go there and comment will definitely not disappoint you. Thank you so much, Omar, for answering this uh, question. And um, I've got another question for Natalia. And this uh, question is from Janet. And there's a most recent, I, I actually got this update on your page that uh, can you cal clarify the $4 top up funding for our frontline workers? Can you explain this in detail? Lots of people are still confused, want to know a lot about that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Janet, for the question. And so this is uh, what we call pandemic pay uh, or critical pay for uh, some of our frontline staff. Uh, I know that during SARS, this is something that the provincial government uh, provided. And so we have made the consideration and we have announced a couple of days ago that we will be providing an additional $4 per hour top up uh, for uh, frontline staff. And this staff can include nurses, uh, cleaning staff, meal preparation staff, and correctional officers um, from uh, facilities such as long-term care, retirement homes, home and community care, social service congregate care settings, corrections, and some uh, some select staff in acute care settings. And so, uh, so whatever they are making right now, we will be topping it up uh, by four dollars per hour for the next sixteen weeks. And in addition, we will be providing for anyone who works over 100 hours per month, uh, a lump, lump sum payment of $250 extra to top up uh, to top up their pay. And so, you know, this is to ensure that we do attract people to work in long term care settings and in critical care settings where we need uh, help the most right now. And because we, you know, our staff are taking additional risks uh, as we are fighting COVID-19. Uh, that is why you know we think it's appropriate and adequate to to support them with uh, with this critical care pay. Well, thank you so okay. much, uh, Natalia, uh, for uh, answering these questions. So, as I said, we have very limited time and lots of questions uh, are being asked on the messages, on the emails. Uh, but um, now we have to uh, wrap up this uh, whole Facebook Live broadcast. Uh, and before we go, let me just uh, bring uh, um, all the participants on the screen. Thank you so much uh, to all of you uh, for being part of this uh, Facebook Live broadcast, for answering the questions. Uh, so before you go, uh, Omar, what do you want to say? Uh, again, uh, Rana, I want to start by thanking you for moderating this session. Uh, I want to uh, once again emphasize my gratitude to Natalia uh, and her staff for coordinating and facilitating this broadcast. Uh, good to see my colleague and friend, Ron Starr. Um, look, thank bottom you. line is that we know I know we have a limited time today, but if anybody fe still feels has questions, uh, at least from the federal level that has not been answered yet, please email me at omar.algabra at r.uc.ca or you can come to my Facebook page and see the email address. If you send me an email with your questions, uh, my team and I will be more than happy to respond to them. But thank you to all of uh, the viewers and uh, we're here to help. We are here to help. Thank you so much. Uh, Omar dot, um, Al Gabra, And uh, let me just spell it for the people. It's O-M-A-R dot uh, A-L-G-H-A-B-R-A. -A -A. I correctly spell your name. Uh, at, uh, at, um, at, um, uh, at Parl, uh, as in shortened parliament, P-A-R-L dot mm -hmm. C dot C-A. All right, so that's the email address. You can always send them an email and definitely their stuff will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Omar. And uh, before uh, we move to Natalia, let me just uh, um, get some ending words from Ron. Ron, what do you want to say? I just want to say thank you very much for uh, hosting and, and to Natalia for putting this together. I just want to say to all the people out there, we're all in this together and uh, let's work together. And I just want to be brief and uh, be safe and be friendly. And don't forget to call your loved ones. Thank you so much. I must say that I'm so much obsessed by your voice, Ron. You've got a wonderful voice. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, all right, uh, Natalia, definitely it was your initiative uh, and to conduct this uh, live Facebook broadcast. And we got uh, pretty much uh, answers of lots of uh, questions. Uh, so what do you want to say? And then 
So again, I just want to say a huge thank you to my colleagues and to yourself. Uh, you know, I think it's really important that we do stay connected even as we are uh, remaining in isolation. And I will always end up by saying thank you to all Ontarians and all Canadians really who have really taken to heart the advice of our chief medical officers and have stayed at home because, you know, as a frontline provider, I can tell you that it has been working and we have not hit the huge surge, which we are all very worried about and preparing for. And so a huge thank you to all of you. I know, I know, I know it's not easy staying at home, uh, but please continue, stay put, you know, um, I, I just want to mention mental health, you know, it's very important that we check in with each other and there are some providers which are available through virtual platforms. And so please, you know, even though we are apart, take this opportunity to, you know, uh, stay, reconnect with your friends. Maybe there are some people you haven't reached out in a while. Give them a call and see how they're doing. And especially our seniors, our seniors who are the most vulnerable right now. I know today I called my grandma in Poland and we had a great conversation. And so I really encourage everyone out there to reach out to your loved ones, especially seniors. Uh, and like I mentioned, my office is providing some services uh, for seniors. So if anyone needs uh, um, some free groceries or, or some um, some help right now, as um, as we are fighting COVID-19, feel free to reach out to my office at 905-890-1901. And just a huge thank you to our wonderful frontline workers. Uh, that includes nurses, doctors, paramedics, police enforcement, correctional uh, workers, uh, our, our grocery clerks, um, so and, and everyone who has been really doing their part um, and following the isolation procedures. So huge thank you. And once again, uh, to everyone celebrating uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, as you said, uh, that basically it is uh, our responsibility. It is our duty to contribute just a little bit or maybe more, whatever our capacity is to deal with this pandemic, to beat this pandemic. And definitely we will gonna do it. And we are, our hopes are high, our spirits are high, and we will together gonna beat this pandemic. Thank you so much to all the participants uh, for uh, being part of the show. Thank you so much to everyone who sent the message and my apologies to all those people who sent the messages, but uh, we, we were not able to include it, but uh, we will definitely connect back to you guys again, and we'll keep on conducting these live sessions for you. Thank you. So so much and take care and have a good night.